up to the Lewis School of Law at the University of Montana. My name is Paul Kurgis and I am the Dean here and I'm very pleased uh, to have you here for this uh, topical and exciting program, Divide and Fall, What are the Legal and Political Implications of the Supreme Court's Current Vacancy and Nomination? Uh, I'll start with a, a thanks to our sponsors uh, for tonight's program. Uh, we have two sponsors, and, and we see the, uh, the rough division of ages in the audience. We have uh, the, the Montana American Constitutional Society chapter here at the, the School of Law, and uh, we're grateful to the officers of that organization, Caitlin Lamb and, and Melanie Disidoro, for uh, helping to put this uh, on. And then uh, from the University of Montana Retirees Association, um, Arlene Walker-Andrews, the, the chair of the organization, helped us uh, to bring this all together uh, in a short period of time. Um, and that's part of what, what the Retirees Association is attempting to do, is to have topical conversations about matters that are in the news and that are on people's minds. And, and certainly this is one of those. Uh, during the presidential election years, the Supreme Court is always a topic of conversation. And this year the court has taken center stage in, in the political discourse with uh, the passing of Justice Antonin Scalia and um, the resulting equilibrium on the court with the potential for the court uh, to tip uh, the five to four balance from what has been um, a, a conservative balance um, over the, the past almost two decades now uh, to maybe a five to four split the other way. Um, and as we know, the Republicans in the Senate have declared that they will not consider um, a nominee appointed by President Obama and that they um, prefer to wait until the fall elections are complete to consider any nominee for the open position. On the other hand, uh, President Obama has nominated Merrick Garland, the Chief Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Now, if this stalemate holds, of course, the court is likely to be deadlocked four to four on many of the more controversial cases on its docket, both for the rest of this term and for next term, at least until uh, we have a resolution of the presidential election. There, there's been a, a tremendous amount of media coverage of this uh, situation, and that coverage is often contained hyperbole, if not outright misinformation. And, and today we are fortunate to have a group of panelists um, who will be able to help bring some clarity to these issues, including two of, of our own leading scholar, constitutional scholars and, and our state senator, who is uh, going to find himself in the middle of this controversy. So I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce our, our panelists and we'll get started. Um, we have on my far left, Dr. Patrick Peel, a visiting assistant professor in the political science department here at the university. Dr. Peel holds a master's in philosophy and a PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he has a, an interesting approach to constitutional issues and the rule of law, uh, where much constitutional scholarship examines legal institutions from the top down, focusing on how elite institutions like the Supreme Court shape society. Dr. Peel looks at the rule of law from the ground up, examining the, the historical and social factors that have helped to shape the rule of law over the centuries in our constitutional democracy. He teaches American political thought and American constitutional law here uh, in the university. Directly to my left, we have Professor Anthony Johnstone. Those of you who are students here know Professor Johnstone. Um, as our constitutional law professor, he graduated from Yale University and the University of Chicago School of Law, clerked for uh, the Honorable Sidney Thomas, who's now the Chief Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and served as Solicitor and Assistant Attorney General here in Montana, arguing constitutional questions before the Montana Supreme Court. He's published widely in the areas of federalism, election law, campaign finance, with a particular focus on the relationship between state and federal constitutional law. And we're very fortunate today to have with us 
Uh, United States Senator John Tester, he needs less introduction, I think, than the rest. Uh, grew up here in Shoto County, Montana, on the farm. His grandfather homesteaded. I understand he came there uh, today and will head back there tonight. A graduate of Great Falls University. Uh, he served as president of the Montana State Senate before being elected to the United States Senate in 2006 and then winning re-election most recently in, in 2012. Um, so our rough format here tonight, we'll, we'll lead off with Senator Tester. He'll give us the view uh, of someone with boots on the ground, uh, followed by uh, Professor Peel to talk about the political dimensions of this controversy, and then Professor Johnstone to talk about the legal dimensions. And to uh, moderate our conversation, we have um, our, our uh, Blue School of Law student, Corey Losing, who will help us understand these issues better. Corey. Can everybody hear me? Yes, great. Uh, thank you, Dean Curtis, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming this evening to our um, panel that we're very excited about. Uh, as Dean said, my name is Corey, and I'm currently a one out here, so I actually don't have that much enlightenment about these issues at the moment, but I'm hoping to gain some from these esteemed panelists. Uh, so, as Dean said, we would like to first open up discussion to Senator Tester and ask him what he believes are the broad political implications on the current vacancy and nomination of the United States Supreme Court. Senator? Since the year 1900, six justices have been confirmed in a presidential election year. Six of them. Including 
uh, current Justice Kennedy, who was confirmed in the last year of the Reagan administration by a 97 to nothing vote. One third of all previous presidents have had a nominee confirmed to the Supreme Court in an election. And since 1875, every Supreme Court nominee has received a Senate hearing or a vote. The folks who came before us understood the consequences of a balanced court. Without a ninth justice on the court, it's fair to say cases could be decided by a 4 4 vote. Uh, and would not be able to establish uniform or nationwide laws. Lower courts' uh, rulings would remain in place. Cases involving collective bargaining, re reproductive rights, water rights, educational opportunities uh, may not get a final ruling. And this is all because, and I am the last person who want to be, wants to be political, but it's a fact. This is all because the Senate Republicans have decided to ignore the Constitution. They have decided to ignore almost 150 years of precedent. Uh, precedents. They have decided not to do their job. Uh, they're willing to have cases that impact your life be derailed because they want President Trump or President Cruz to nominate the next justice to the Supreme Court. I think that's wrong, uh, not because it's one political party or another, but because I think it sets a dangerous precedent that will put future nominations at risk. It will make a dysfunctional Congress, in essence, more dysfunctional. Now, I want to tell you what I'm going to do. When I get back after Easter, I'm going to reach out to Judge Garland. I'm going to meet with him personally. I'm going to ask him tough questions. I'm going to ask him about the balance of power between the three branches. And I'm going to ask him about recognizing states' rights, about protecting our civil liberties. I'm going to ask him what he thinks the role of the Supreme Court should be in our day-to-day -day lives. And it is during these face-to-face -face meetings, and it is during public hearings, that we'll find out if this judicial nominee is fit to serve on the nation's highest court. Now, there are a lot of folks who I serve with who wrap themselves in the Constitution when it's convenient. But lately, I believe they have been wrapping themselves far too tight because they're ignoring their constitutional duty, and it is not fair to the American people. Folks expect the representatives of Congress to show up every day and do their jobs, just like the hardworking families they represent. Judge Garland is an honorable man. He deserves a hearing, he deserves a vote, the American people deserve a debate, and it is truly time for Congress to do their damn job. Now, as I mentioned, in a few weeks, uh, I'm going to be questioning Judge Garland. You brought up a question about how this potential precedence is going to affect, I don't know if the words are not, is going to affect uh, future Congresses. The broad political implications. The broad political implications is, is once this is done, people will look back in the Senate and say, look, in 2016, we had a Supreme Court justice pass, and nothing was done for a year and a half. So we've got a year and a half <coughs> to confirm this next Supreme Court justice. As I pointed out, I have a certain level of frustration with Congress and them uh, not doing their job. And, and I think that uh, in this particular case, and I say this as a dirt farmer from North Central Montana, not as a law student, not as a former law professor, not as somebody who even has had a kid who's went to law school, not a person who needs to have a brother or a relative somewhere, and I'm sorry about that, because I'd like to borrow some money from him. But <laughs> I do say this as a citizen, and I just, I really think that, that uh, this precedence is not healthy for our democracy, and it's not healthy for Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tester. Um, we would now like to welcome any questions for just the senator at this time. So if anyone wants to ask, just, I guess, stand up and, like, yes. Given that the Republican position that they've taken is unconventional, is there any consideration for an option to be unconventional and hold a public hearing of this candidate? Right. Let me go ahead and take that letter in. Did everybody hear that question? You can repeat the question. Okay, the question is, um, since uh, leadership on the Republican side has laid down the gauntlet, so to speak, and uh, chosen not to have a hearing, is there some way we can have a hearing without their blessings? Is that fairly accurate? Pretty much, yeah. 
No. Uh, the, reason is, the reason is because uh, that's why elections matter, that's why being in the majority matters. If you're in the majority, you determine the agenda. And it really is up to uh, the leader of the Senate, who is Senator McConnell, with Senator Grassley, who chairs the Judiciary Committee, to set that up. We could set off, we could have hearings, so-called hearings, off campus, or I don't know, maybe we could even do it on campus, but it would, it would serve absolutely no function whatsoever, other than draw attention to it for the press. So you might see it for that reason. But as far as it uh, forcing a vote, no, it, the vote will only be forced if the chairman of the Judiciary Committee says we're going to do this. Yes, ma'am? Um, as a politician, this is why I'm asking you, do, do you guys read your mail? If everybody in the United States sent a letter to Mitch McConnell, would it make any difference whatsoever? Absolutely. Um, it, uh, it makes a heck of a difference. Uh, what frustrates me is people say, well, you know, I don't call you guys, I don't write you guys, I don't email you guys because it doesn't do any good. That couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, I don't care what the issue is. We dealt with a dark act last week, and I will tell you, some of my friends were on the opposite side of that issue as me, and they were complaining about the number of emails they were getting. Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing on this. Uh, make, your, make your opinions known. I think it is critically important how the democracy works. And I guarantee you, you might not think it does any good, but it does good. Yeah. Back there, we guess. Uh, so with the threat of, you know, these more unconventional Republican candidates right now, um, is there any except for Trump and Cruz? No, that's very good. Very, very um, <laughs> is there any possibility that the Republicans currently in Congress would be willing to backtrack their original position of well, some of them have. Um, Senator Moran out of Kansas uh, just heard today put out a press release that said we ought to do it. <clears throat> there have been other Senator Kirk Allen out of Illinois who said we ought to do it. Uh, and that means have a hearing, have a vote. So there, there might be, uh, there, there might be with pressure, um, there, there might be uh, enough pressure within the caucus for the leader of the side. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Since this has clearly been a political act, how much risk would you judge the Republican Party is taking with this stance? And how do you expect the Democratic Party will publicize that and how? Well, um, I think what you're going to see out of, uh, out of uh, folks on the Democratic side is they're going to continue to push uh, to get them to have a hearing um, on Mary Garland. I think that um, they'll push in a number of ways. Uh, they'll push with press conferences, they'll push with editorials, they'll push just every way they possibly can. They, uh, that's just the way it's going to be. There will be pushes to have that hearing. As for the impact on the election, I don't know. I would love to say that I think it's going to have um, impacts, but remember this, we are in March, uh, we are um, nine months away from an election, that's a long time politically speaking, and it's still got to be in the, if it was held today, I'd say absolutely would happen, if the election was held today, I'd say absolutely would happen in that. But nine months from now, it may not be at the front of the head, it's still, um, part of that's our job, um, but, uh, uh, but truthfully, I, I think it was a political mistake, but I don't think having a hearing on a nominee by the president, such as Merrick Garland, is a bad thing for the Republicans. And I will tell you why, from a sure political standpoint. He's very moderate. He's got a pretty squeaky cream, clean record. I believe he's 63 years of age. From a Democratic standpoint, I would love to see somebody nominated like Judge Roberts was. I mean, Judge Roberts can be around until my kids are old. Truthfully, he will be. So why not get somebody that's younger? I don't know what's going to happen this election cycle. I don't know if the Senate will flip from Republican to Democrat. I don't know if there will be a Democrat in the White House. But I would say the odds of those are reasonably good. If that were to happen, that nominee, whoever did, whether it's Bernie or Hillary, would be several clicks to the left, several clicks to the left, and much, much younger. 
So I think they're taking a gamble, politically speaking, by saying we're not going to do anything. Needless to say, these guys will square this around. Constitutionally, I think they're on very, very uh, slippery slope. Yes, sir. Um, as a senator, what do you think your standard on advice and consent should be? Should it be, as Chief Justice Roberts said a week before Justice Scalia died, qualifications of the nominee? Well, or, or are their ideological leanings fair to Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, for me, it's going to be. Um, I touched on a little bit in my talk, where they're at in civil liberties, where they're at in states' rights, where they're at, one of them's right to choose, what their record has been in the past, that they, that they've been willing to make decisions that were solid under the Constitution. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be, a, the other thing is this, I, I get an advantage that probably most of you don't get, that I get to look the guy in the eye, and I get to determine what he's made of, and uh, I feel pretty good about that. Um, and uh, I think that uh, being a lifelong Montana, I, I think I understand uh, Montana values, hard work, and family, and all those kind of things. And so we're going to see uh, we're going to see what the guy's made of. Now, look, I've read some about him since he got nominated. And I think that. Uh, He's a pretty quality guy, but uh, but we'll find out how to answer some questions. So, little each. Yes, yes sir. Um, You talked a little bit about how there's concern on the Republican Party if um, a Democrat wins the presidential election that they'll nominate someone on the left. And I know there's been some talk that they were trying to allay the confirmation of Merrick Garland if that were the case. Do you think that undermines him being nominated to the court in kind of this, like, best of a bad decision at all? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what they'll do with, uh, with a lame duck nomination, but um, that would really, 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 really be political. I mean, that means that the only reason, there's not a shadow of a doubt, the only reason they held this group first time was because of political reasons. Not because they wanted the next president to choose, as they say now but because of political reasons. And I just think it makes them look very, very shallow. Did I answer your question? I was wondering how you felt if it would undermine uh, Merrick Garland's position on the court, where the, court, well, the open I, public would know that it was a blatant political move. It, 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 it might. I don't, I, I think once you're on the court, and I don't know this, but once you're on the court, I think you <coughs> I think you're the same stature of everybody else. That's Justice Kennedy, who is number three. <laughs> um, we're going to about to close the question portion, so if there's just one last good question, we'll take that. Yes, sir. Um, I remember during a uh, Republican <laughs> debate, uh, Donald Trump had said the strategy is delay, delay, delay. Um, you know, you being a senator, what? What would you say are the odds that they could actually pull this off the Republican uh, Congress? That they can actually delay this for a year? I think they're pretty high. I um, I don't know what Vegas has got it at, but uh, <laughs> but look, um, I was told I don't know if this is a fact, but I was told right after he was nominated, uh, Senator McConnell called up Merrick Garland and said, "It's fine, you can run around Capitol Hill, but you're not going to get a hearing." If that's his position and he sticks that, to that position, they absolutely will. They'll be able to hold on. Um, yeah. So, well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
do this fairly easily, I'm going to give it a shot here. Let's see. There are chairs up here, by the way. For there are uh, like seven, eight, nine chairs up here. If people want to move up a little bit. In the time. <laughs> or if you already have your extra credit for class, I guess you could go. Of these 
have been voted on by the Senate. And since 1948, 28 of 32 nominees have been confirmed. So confirmations usually do happen, um, and the Senate usually votes on nominees put forth by the President. And again, perhaps later we can get into the question um, about uh, cases in which the Senate has rejected nominees, because it goes to this question as to whether there's a constitutional duty and obligation of the Senate to hold hearings and vote on a nominee. So then, why do nominees sometimes get into difficulty? Well, sometimes there are qualification issues, competency issues or ethical issues. Um, a couple recent cases, George W. Bush um, withdrew the nomination, nomination of Harriet Myers because there was opposition from within the Republican Party over the nominee. Uh, Ronald Reagan um, withdrew the nomination of Douglas Ginsburg because it was revealed that Douglas Ginsburg had smoked pot at one point and therefore he was out. Um, so there are things like, this is not going to happen with Garland, right? Garland has been a circuit court judge on the D.C. Circuit, the second most important court in the United States. He's already gone through a confirmation hearing, and indeed, ever since Sotomayor was appointed to the court, he's been on the short list of the Obama administration. So this is someone who's highly competent and who's been vetted, okay? But much more important than the qualification issue is the political environment in which a nominee finds themselves, and in particular, the partisan composition of the Senate. And this brings me to the six reasons that I don't think Republicans are going to give on the Garland nomination. First, um, increased partisanship um, between parties. Um, and generally speaking, when you see increased partisanship uh, uh, among the parties, this does not bode well for a nominee. These numbers come from Keith Poole at the University of Georgia. Um, who is kind of the, the leading light in coming up with uh, uh, various partisanship scoring uh, data based on roll call data. And if you want to, if you really are interested in this data, you can go to his blog, which is called Vote, the Vote View Blog, and you can get all kinds of data on this. But what you can see here is in the last four decades, right, the Senate with the dotted line pulling away increasingly from the Democratic Party, uh, more extreme than the Democratic Party, of course, but you can see that gapping out, okay? Just another slide to give you a little historical, this is larger sets of data, which is just to say, you know, we're kind of talking about a pretty, a pretty small slice of time here in the United States. Um, if you go back, you see much more partisanship throughout the history of the United States. And you can, you can see, beginning in 1968, um, right at the time, kind of around the 1968 Democratic Convention, the first time that the filibuster is used to deny um, Lyndon Johnson, 8 4 to the Supreme Court. A very interesting case with regards to this constitutional question, which maybe we'll get. You can see these things begin to pull away um, uh, during the contemporary period that we live in. This is just some more kind of a different kind of uh, uh, visual representation of uh, the same sort of the same data by pool over time. And this is where we're at now with more extreme sorting between the parties um, in the Senate and in the House. Okay. This is just another same data, just pulled off the internet, um, just showing the increased partisanship of the Senate since 1997 when um, Garland was confirmed by the Senate originally. Again, you can see the Senate's on uh, the Republican side and the Democratic side, but particularly on the Republican side, has pulled more to the right. Okay. This is some other data compiled by Lee Epstein um, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and based on the Martin Quinn scores, uh, Martin at the University of Michigan and Quinn at the University of Berkeley, and they've come up with complicated data in part using the same methodology as, um, as Poole uses. Um, and you can see kind of on an ideological spectrum where the, where the justices are. Thomas would have been, uh, excuse me, Scalia would have been over here by Thomas. You can see that um, Garland is is over here in the other, um, the, other, um, the other quadrant. The point of showing these two things is to highlight for you that even if Garland is more moderate, relatively speaking, right, he's not more moderate relative to this, right? So even if he pulls more to the center, he's still more out of tune with the increasingly polarized Senate, okay? Uh, so there's a gap, a big gap between Garland and the Republicans in the Senate, um, and that's a problem. 
for his nomination. Okay? The second reason, um, of course, is that Garland would be a swing vote in important 5-4 decisions, and this would change the ideological structure of the court. Um, if you just kind of look, I mean, if you just take the most recent, um, you know, the most recent justices, you can see we have very close um, decisions with Kagan, Sotomayor, um, and Roberts. Um, close, you know, I mean, uh, highly contentious uh, votes in the Senate. Um, but each one of these three were largely fought to keep the ideological makeup of the Supreme Court similar. Alito was thought, Alito took O'Connor's slot, and Alito was perceived to be a more conservative justice, and there was more partisanship and more contention over his nomination because of that. And you can see, right, um, the 58-42 um, split vote in the Senate. So um, uh, the second reason, as I say, is that Garland would be a swing vote in important decisions, um, and uh, when you have a justice that's replacing another justice, um, and there's a gap in the ideological spectrum between them, you see more political contention, and that doesn't bode well for the nomination um, either. Okay? And then we have this guy, right? <laughs> Deal with it. Um, and we have this guy, who just lost Florida. Um, that's to say we have the Republican Party, and what is going on with the Republican Party. The Republican Party is in the kind of political turmoil that we see once in a while in American politics, but is pretty rare. I mean, maybe the last time, I mean, it's hard to say, maybe the last time we saw this was when the you know, Democratic Party fell apart in 1968, hard to say. Um, but what Rubio's defeat in Florida means is it means that the ideological package and the constituencies that had been bound together into the Republican Party, that that model is falling apart for the Republicans. Trump's platform is not the platform of a Marco Rubio. It signals something different in the country. And the base of the Republican Party is not interested in the sort of Marco Rubio type of platform. Uh, put that together with the fact that the Republican Party, like no other modern political party in American history, has put jurisprudence a certain vision of the Constitution at the very center of its politics and its coalition. Okay? Anti-abortion issues, religious liberty issues and groups, gun rights activists, anti-regulatory policies, law and order issues, civil rights affirmative action issues. Um, and the Republican Party still tells grand narratives and stories about the Constitution and what the Constitution means for the United States. For years, I've been trying to get constitutions from various liberal um, advocacy groups and conservative interest groups, so I can have the same Constitution but two different um, you know, faces on the Constitution. Um, I can get boxes of constitutions from the Heritage Society. I cannot get constitutions from any other liberal interest group, and I've tried. But the conservatives put this story about the Constitution at the very center of their politics. And of course, the ACS was founded, was founded in part because the Democratic Party realized that this was an issue the Republicans were succeeding on, and therefore they wanted to take this issue away from the Republicans to some extent. Um, so it's at the heart of Republican identity, and I think it means that for constituencies in the Republican Party, they can't give on this issue. The base doesn't want to give on this issue, okay? All right, so fourth reason. Um, is that we don't just have a presidential election underway. Um, this is just a slide that shows how committed ideologically Republicans are uh, and that they see the Democratic Party as being a threat, right, an attack on the Constitution in some way, um, and therefore is a problem, okay? Um, all right, we don't just have a presidential election underway. We also have Senate elections underway. Uh, and the Democratic need, Party needs to pick up, I guess, what, about five seats um, to take back the Senate. So there are a bunch of very close Senate seats um, right now. Um, Illinois, of course, Mark Kirk versus Tammy Duckworth. And of course, where is Garland from? Illinois, right? This is an issue you can beat up Mark Kirk with, you know, every day. 
Um, and if you go, I just for fun, I went to the web pages of Tammy.worth and Maggie Hansen. If you go to the web pages, you'll see that that's an issue. That's a campaign issue. Okay. Uh, so back to the polarization issue. Um, I know I'm kind of running out of time. Back to the polarization issue. Uh, the Democrat Party is going to want to have hearings on this because what they want to show is that the Republicans are polarized and they're out of the mainstream and Garland is a centrist candidate. The Republican Party absolutely does not want to have hearings because it would show just that, okay? But they do want to mobilize their base, okay? And they want their base to be committed to these sorts of issues. I just went to the NRA's webpage the other day, right splashed on the front, Garland's going to take away the Second Amendment. <laughs> Scalia, right? Heller, v. D.C., right? Um, Scalia's signature case on um, this nominee is going to take that away from us. We can't possibly let that happen. So I think um, I think the politics is at the center. We don't have polling data for this, but I think the calculation by the Republicans <coughs> is that Republican voters care about these constitutional issues more than independent voters do because of some of the data that I showed you. Um, so that in order to keep the Senate, they need to appeal to their base to take a stand on this issue. And of course, McConnell worries that if he doesn't take an issue to stand on this, the people on his right are going to attack him. Um, so they think they're going to be able to get their base out on this issue. And the Democrats are feeling pretty confident, they think, and so simply won't be motivated enough by this issue. Senator Tester probably has better polling data on this. I, I don't have polling data. That's my intuition. The Gallup poll consistently shows that nominations to the Supreme Court are virtually insignificant to voters in general. But it's not insignificant to the base of different parties, right? And I think that's what the Republicans uh, are counting on, um, the, that the Republican voters and the Republican base will feel that they have more to lose on this nomination than independent voters will or that the Democrats will. Okay, very risky strategy. It may be a complete miscalculation with regards to public opinion, and the Democrats will keep trying to put pressure on them on this issue to show that they're irrational and they shouldn't uh, be doing this. Uh, and of course, um, the party may split up if we have a contested convention by the Republicans um, and uh, the Republican establishment denies Trump what he thinks is his rightful um, uh, position in the party. So we'll have to see very high stake strategy. Okay? And the fifth and final reason is optionality. Um, as someone mentioned during the questions with Senator Tester, um, the Republicans can simply um, you know, backtrack on this lame duck appointment. Um, and whether that would cost them politically or not, they'll have to make those kinds of calculations. Um, but they very well may be willing to do that, um, given that we're talking about 5-4 um, um, decisions on the court. Okay? Um, so that's all I have to say on that. That's the politics, I think. Law classes would be canceled 
And because no professor can, in good conscience, purport to say what the constitutional law is until we know who fills that ninth seat. Um, there, there's something true to that, and as Senator Tesser uh, alluded to, we're looking at probably, um, if there's no confirmation during President Obama's term, we're looking at uh, two terms, um, two full terms at least, of not having resolution before four times. We'll talk about that. Uh, I'll get back to that uh, um, towards the end. Um, so I think we uh, first just want to acknowledge that we um, have lost a, a real giant of the bench with, with Justice Scalia. He's made historic contributions to constitutional law, criminal procedure, legislation, um, administrative law. Um, most of you probably don't know that administrative law was Justice Scalia's first passion. That's what he uh, began to teach. That's what he practiced. Um, and he still, has, has, he still casts a, a large shadow over um, administrative law. Um, as law students know, his, his opinions, um, like Heller versus District of Columbia, which is oftentimes a starting point now, it's replaced in many casebooks. Marbury versus Madison is the starting point for constitutional law courses. Um, is uh, eminently readable, a, a true model casebook <coughs> opinion. Um, and whether you agree with them or not, as Justice Ginsburg remarked on his death, um, she was especially grateful for his work on the court. She said, we disagree now and then. <laughs> when I wrote for the court and received a Scalia dissent, the opinion ultimately released that she wrote was notably better than my initial draft. Justice Scalia nailed all the weak spots, the applesauce and arble barble, <laughs> later years, uh, and gave me just what I needed to strengthen my opinion. You know, I, I think any student, lawyer, uh, even law professor, and, and dare I say even a senator, should wish to have at least one colleague, um, maybe at, at most one colleague, uh, who's uh, strength and clarity of opposition makes your own work better, and I think Justice Scalia certainly did that. Um, I won't spend too much on this because uh, Professor Peel talked about this, but this is a critical juncture for the Supreme Court. The Roberts Court has become a little bit more liberal by conventional measures, but it is the most conservative court, uh, Supreme Court in decades. Um, and uh, uh, it became so with uh, really with replacement not of Roberts for Rehnquist, but of uh, Justice Alito, Alito for uh, Justice O'Connor. Um, and, and that means there's really no way out of it. This is, these are the ideologies with, of all the justices. Um, but um, there's no way out of the fact, given that the court is now one of the most conservative um, in the past 80 years, that any Democratic appointee will make the court one of the most liberal uh, over the past 80 years. Um, even with the repl replacement of Justice, Scal uh, Justice Scalia with uh, Judge Garland. Um, you can kind of see there's a yellow line here that, that shows who the median justice is, um, up and, and down. Um, but you know, right now, it's, it's, and it's, as we see, it's gotten a little bit, quite a bit more liberal in recent years. But um, generally, the Roberts Court has been one of the most conservative. There's, there's no way other than a Democratic appointee will make it one of the most liberal. That's just because of where they sit. Um, Judge Garland, actually, the, uh, Professor Peel um, had an ideological score up there for Judge Garland. I, I, um, it's not clear that Judge Garland is just in the pack with the current justices. He probably is, he, he may even be to the right of, of uh, Justice Breyer. Um, that methodology simply was reporting that Judge Garland was appointed by President Clinton, and so therefore, um, without additional information about his performance on the Supreme Court in a hypothetical case, and a justice has a different job than a judge, a justice gets to um, uh, uh, be the Supreme Court as opposed to have to follow the Supreme Court, it's possible that he's even more moderate than that, to the point that uh, I think just today um, a former Bush White House lawyer said that if they had had a vacancy to fill with a Democratic Senate, uh, President Bush uh, likely would have picked Judge Garland. Um, and so that shows you something about the politics right now that a, a Bush appointee under a Democratic Senate um, uh, uh, would have been uh, the president's choice and probably confirmed um, is now a uh, uh, Democratic President Obama's uh, uh, nominee with the Republicans. Um, and he, but even that shift, um, even the shift in, uh, from Scalia to Garland, assuming uh, Garland is uh, uh, something like a Clinton, typical Clinton appointee, 
is a much smaller shift in, in, in magnitude across the ideological spectrum than, for example, the, the biggest one in our history, and this was, that vote was 52 uh, to 48 for a reason on Justice Thomas. The replacement of Justice Thurgood Marshall with Justice Thomas um, was the swing all the way from the bottom of the chart all the way to the top of the chart in terms of liberal to conservative. And so that's one of the reasons you just, the, the court is going to swing one way or the other as these, as these new justices are added. Um, next to only um, uh, uh, great Western Justice Douglas um, up to Justice Stevens is the only other big one, which isn't really a reflection on Justice Stevens' conservatism so much as where Justice Douglas was or wasn't at the end of his career on the court. Um, okay, so so with, with that that background, let's talk about the law. So this is this is the law, Article Two, Section Two: The President shall nominate by with the consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court, and uh, just walk through some of the um, the basic legal arguments around it. This is a no one's going to go to court and win a case on, on this on this nominee. This is non-justiciable. Um, this is United States versus Nixon, not that Nixon, remember the Commonwealth, but um, another Judge Nixon. Um, the Senate's in control of its own, own rules. But um, I think there is a, a good uh, textual argument in looking at this is that I don't think we can really say, if you look at Article 2 um, or Article 1, Section 5, that describes how Congress acts, there's nothing in there about press releases. Um, one senator issue, that, that actually doesn't count as the Senate performing its role. Um, the Senate performs its role, they refer to journals, um, they refer to the business of the Senate in the Noel Canning case recently where they talked about recess appointments, they talked about the Senate being in session, was measured by its power to conduct business. Um, I do think there's, uh, it's not a, a um, game winner by any means, and this is all politics anyway, but I think there is a textual justification to say that um, the Senate can't claim to be performing its role to advise and consent um, uh, if it's not actually meeting as the Senate and doing so. Um, a bunch of senators acting separately is not the Senate. Um, and there's, there's a, um, a recent argument, I think just yesterday a couple of law professors argued, um, and it's an interesting argument, that what effectively they're doing is, is, is a separation of powers violation. They're delegating this president's authority to nominate and appoint judges of the Supreme Court to future presidents, and that that's, that's something that, that typically, if you look at delegation questions elsewhere, that's not typically something con we let Congress do, is to take the president's power and give it to someone else. Um, it's a creative argument. Again, these aren't going to be argued in, anywhere, but I think that's the textual basis for um, uh, some of Senator Tester's concerns. Um, the structural basis, if, if you look at it, there's a discussion in Article 3, there's only one Supreme Court. Um, and so presumably we have to have one, the Supreme Court. And for most of our history, this, although the Supreme Court has been evenly divided at times after the Civil War, um, early in the, um, in the Republic it had even numbers of justices, but for almost all of American history it's had odd numbers of justices. And that becomes important because the Supreme Court can only act through its powers in deciding cases. And you can't decide a case if you have an even number. In fact, that's what the court for the first time this week is now doing. Um, this term is it's starting to issue four four decisions in which it can't exercise its judicial power. Um, so that might be a structural argument. Um, uh, an argument from precedent, those are the ones we really see, right? These arguments about what, what Senator McConnell said, um, about we never, in the past 80 years, we've never confirmed someone who's, who's been nominated in election year. Um, and then they talk about, well, we've, we've, confirmed, we've confirmed people in election years who may have been nominated earlier, and when did the vacancies occur? Um, <coughs> This is, um, this is the, the paper I alluded to, but um, uh, a couple of law professors really dug into that data, every single nomination. Um, and I think, first of all, I should say, it is, when you go back, it, it, the last time that the Senate never heard, um, never held, never heard, never considered, rejected, or confirmed a candidate, right? Never took action on a candidate. You have to go, go all the way back to um, President Johnson no, not that Johnson, um, Andrew Johnson's nomination in the wake of the Civil War by the Radical Republican Reconstruction Congress um, when they were fighting over the legacy of, right, this was, this was when 
the 14th Amendment was being um, drafted and decided, um, Johnson was impeached. You have to go back that far to find a time where the Senate, did, it's just set everything else aside, to find a time when the Senate did not uh, either confirm or reject um, a, a justice, a, a nomination. Um, and what these professors, uh, these are professors Carr and uh, Mazzone, um, when, when they looked back, they discovered that um, some of these exceptions to uh, appointments that have been cited, when the, the uh, other times where the Senate hasn't acted on nominees, um, every single time the Senate hasn't acted on the nominee of a president before the president's term has ended, uh, every single time can be explained as one of two instances, which speak to this question of, of letting the people decide. Either the uh, nomination was made um, after um, the uh, election. After. So, so imagine Scalia dying in November after the election, and President uh, Trump has been elected. That, that's the situation. So, in the, and I think we can all see why that would be particularly problematic in a way that's completely different than what's currently going on. Right? When the people have actually elected another and then to uh, try to appoint someone before the inauguration, that's the one example of when the Senate has referred, refused to, to act um, on it. Um, and um, the other is that the um, is that the president who was nominated had not himself been elected. And that, again, is another thing that goes to letting the people decide. When, um, so the one counterexample here is President Ford successfully uh, got uh, John L. Stevens confirmed. But if we think about letting the people decide, that actually makes sense. If the people have already decided on another president, then the Senate won't. And if the people never decided on the president because they uh, obtained office through succession, then the people didn't decide. But otherwise, in no other case, and this is 104 for 104 nominations, has the Senate refused to consider a presidential nomination of the Supreme Court. Never. Zero. No exceptions. I think that adds some clarity to some of the um, discussions about what, Eight, what happened with 8 Fortis, or, or you know, whether you have to go back to, to Brandeis um, before. Um, so what kind of argument is this to let the people decide? Well, it's not, it's not based on the text, structure, or, or uh, principle, uh, or precedent of the Constitution. It's a policy argument, at, or maybe a principle, an argument from principle. It's a policy argument. Um, and so I think we should assess it from that and try to figure out in very clear terms what exactly it means. And so what, what is the principle, I guess, we'll, we'll give it its due and call it a, an argument from principle. What is this, uh, what exactly does this mean that the people should have a voice in the <coughs> Supreme Court justice? What, what exactly does that mean? So Mitch, uh, Senator McConnell, Senate Majority Leader McConnell led, um, the people should have a voice, vacancy should not be filled until we add a new president. Senate Judiciary uh, Committee Chairman, defer to the American people, who will elect a new president to select the next Supreme Court justice. So, um, trying to figure out what exactly is this principle. Um, uh, this is the one exception from the quotes I'll, I'll hear. Um, it seems like Senator Tesser hasn't changed his position on that. Uh, actually, yes, we have to confirm someone, or, or at least consider someone. Um, again, right, the Senate, as opposed to press releases, the Senate acts through taking votes. We, we, it, it, that's how it does business. The Constitution talks about recording the yeas and nays. Um, so um, in, uh, uh, um, when you get to Montana's delegation, so Senator Daines, um, um, I think was, um, did he invite to provide a statement? Uh, yeah, he, did, nothing got said. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, so Senator Daines, this, this is an important distinction now as we think about the so-called Biden rule, and the best way to ensure this process remains nonpartisan would be waiting until after the election. So, so, right, he, good lawyers here, does that, that's not the same as what Mitch McConnell is saying. That is leaving open the possibility of a lame duck confirmation. More on that later. But, but I think, right, when you say after the election, that's different from saying the next president. You could be talking about something in December. 
Um, and I included our congressman just because I, I really appreciated, he wrote a, an op-ed on this, and I, I really appreciated it that he said that um, he focused on that idea of advise and said he, he wants the Senate to, to do its job and um, actually listed some, some examples in terms of um, possessing unconditional respect for the Constitution and its original intent. Justice Scalia would correct him and say original meaning, but that's pretty inside baseball. Um, uh, belief in the Second Amendment, um, belief in the separation of balance of power, and belief that the President cannot unilaterally create, create laws. So, so there we're getting somewhere. One of the notable um, omissions from that is, is opposition to Citizens United, which is the only issue of all of those that Montanans are actually on record for. So 75% of Montanans in an initiative passed I-166, which actually, unconstitutionally probably, um, instructed our congressman to um, oppose Citizens United and take whatever means necessary he could, he could take to, um, to reverse the decision. Um, but but this was this was a, a step forward. Of course, he's not in the Senate, so he can't he can't provide this this advice. Um, so so based on that, what what do they mean? Because when there's uh, these these appeals, I, I should add by the way, a senator who's not there, a Democratic senator, um, Burton K. Wheeler. So it's it's and Burton K. Wheeler may provide instruction on both sides of this. It's it's not clear. So Burton K. Wheeler was uh, the Montana senator who was. Um, opposed um, was the strongest Democratic opponent of Roosevelt's court packing line in 1937. And um, what he said, and I think you could replace this with either the, the you could fill it in, uh, Mad Lib style, with either the President or Congress. Um, but his, his uh, concern was, if we're going to play politics with the court, what he said is we're going to create now a political court to echo the ideas of the executive, and again, we might think of that also, or, the, or the, the Congress. And you have created a weapon, a weapon which in the hands of another president, um, in times of war or other hysteria, could well be an instrument of destruction, a weapon that can cut down those guarantees of liberty, written into your great document by the blood of your forefathers, and that can extinguish your right of liberty, of speech, of thought, of action, and religion, a weapon whose use is only dictated by the conscience of the wielder. Um, that was about President Roosevelt fellow Democrat. Um, but um, it wouldn't be hard to see a principle in there, a general principle, against playing politics with uh, the court. Okay, so what does let the people decide mean? Well, I'm trying to figure this out. I think we have two clear examples. Now, these are arguments from democratic legitimacy. They have an important role even in constitutional law. Remember Breyer's dissents in, in, um, in Heller. Um, but for that legitimacy to exist, we have to be clear about the mandate that, the, in this case, the Senate Republicans are claiming. What exactly do they mean to let the people decide so we can vote accordingly? Right? So what is the ballot proposition that we're about to vote on this fall? Um, well, I think we can say, so and there are two, of course, there are, there are four scenarios. Um, the, I, I did check the betting on this, the betting markets. Um, the betting markets right now show about a 71% chance of a president Clinton, a 29% chance of a president, uh, or a Democratic appointee, a 29% chance of a Republican appointee right now. Um, based on that, it gets into conditional probabilities, but it looks like there's something like a 40% chance of a Democratic president and Democratic Senate, 30% chance of a Democratic president and Republican Senate, 30% chance of a Republican president and Republican Senate, and probably not much chance of all of a Republican president um, and a Democratic Senate who would have no coattails. Um, although, wait and see, it's been a crazy mm. cycle so far. Um, so, what do they mean? So these are, the, these are the ballot propositions we get to vote on, right? We get to vote for Senate, we get to vote for President, and they're listening for the voice of the people. So what are they hoping to hear before they make their decisions? Um, okay, so uh, what, what they're, I think what they're hoping to hear most of all is that it's a Republican president and a Republican Senate, in which it's very clear, don't confirm. Right? Don't confirm the new president, the new Senate, they get to pick. Um, right away, first of all, does that mean that, that, that if it's not a supermajority, that they can't filibuster? There's all sorts of issues like that, but that might be the easiest scenario. Don't confirm if, if it's a Republican president and a Republican Senate. If it's a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, confirm, but I'm not sure whether you confirm Garland. This is where they might become a little strategic. 
And they, the, right, the devil they know, Garland, they, grab, they might confirm in a lame duck session, even as a Republican Senate, before the Democrats come in. And it would really move uh, the court. Right? They, they, they would get a much, better, much more liberal nominee if, um, in, in, after Inauguration Day. So confirm, although it's not clear that by what they mean with that, that if, if the vote is overwhelmingly Democratic in an expression that might sound something like, let's get the most liberal possible justice we can get, that that's what they'll actually hear. They probably will say, no, we'll take Garland because he's as good as we're going to get, and then we're out of here. Um, what happens with a Democratic president and a Republican Senate? So where you have a President Sanders or Clinton, and you have... Uh, still Majority Leader McConnell there. Um, you know, prob maybe confirm Garland? I, I don't know whether they confirm. Again, this is, this is, or do they just play it out for longer and maybe hope they can do better? Again, the filibuster's at play. It's not clear in these two other boxes what kind of mandate they're seeking, what it means to let the people that decide or refer to the people. Um, and then this is, this is the least likely scenario, um, but um, if there's a Republican president in a Democratic Senate, so assume that it's something like, we don't like Democratic appointees to the court, but we really, really, really believe that the Senate has a duty to advise and consent, and that's possible. That would be a very pure, um, happy, constitutional way of thinking about things if America did that. Um, it's, it's not clear, right? Are they sending a message? They're rebuking the obstructionism of the Republican Senate, but they're also electing someone who they want to pick someone else. What is the mandate? And again, I think until, um, I hope people ask, until the senators who are saying let the people decide are clear about these two other scenarios, at least one of which is at least as likely as the other two clear scenarios, I, I, I don't think we know what our instructions are, what, what, what we need to say for them to hear us if the people are deciding. Um, so that's, um, that, that's the main contribution. Again, there's not a lot of law here, but I think to the extent there is law, let's be clear about what exactly is the argument from democratic legitimacy, and let's recognize that um, we are voting on both the Senate and, and the President here. Um, so uh, in the meantime, and, and um, I'll just touch on this briefly, um, so what happened? So this is, the, this is the Supreme Court, that's Justice Scalia's, uh, the black bunting is, is now off, that was his former chair, the justices this week for the first time sat in their new order with an empty seat over on the left hand side um, that will wait to be filled. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to likely um, not have a Supreme Court uh, for, in terms of constitutional law. I'm sorry, 1Ls, I will still teach constitutional law, um, and we'll just pretend that Scalia was still around if we don't have a, a new nominee. Um, but um, all, in all sorts of cases, I think it's clear that in, in an abortion case out of Texas um, and the Fifth Circuit, that, that the court might affirm uh, by an equally divided court or remand because they can't quite get the, the votes there. Justice Kennedy seemed hesitant. Uh, the case they just heard uh, uh, yesterday on access to contraception from religiously affiliated organizations, likely, again, you're going to have places where the Constitution means something different in Texas and Louisiana than it does in uh, Montana and Idaho, or, or, um, or in, in the contraception cases um, in the Midwest. The Eighth Circuit is, is on one side of the split. Um, we have a case from Montana about the Speedy Trial Act. Um, or the, the, the speedy trial clause of the Sixth Amendment. That's going to be argued on Monday. It's possible if that divides by a nuclearly divided court, we'll have almost exactly half of the federal courts on one side and half of the federal courts on the other. The Sixth Amendment will provide different protections to criminal defendants, depending on which, which uh, circuit you're in. And the other thing, and this, this is just something that um, um, I'll wrap up after this, but this is one of the puzzling things given that Senator Daines has asked is, is uh, moved to split the Ninth Circuit and um, said, uh, I, right around, uh, during the same discussion, it said, the Ninth Circuit is unable to provide Americans in the West with the service they deserve. Well, what's the implication of not confirming a Ninth Justice? Uh, the Supreme Court in Montana is, guess what? The Ninth Circuit. Because the U.S. Supreme Court, if it's equally divided, will not be in a position to change that. 
And so um, I am a big fan of the Ninth Circuit, um, but um, not every decision. I just you know, used to work for it, so it's a nice place. Um, America's greatest court, size-wise. Um, but um, but if you're, it's a little inconsistent to be against confirming this and then also to complain about the Ninth Circuit because they're, they're basically each federal circuit is going to be the Supreme Court of the states that it sits over. Um, so I'll just, uh, at the end of his dissent in the gay marriage case, Chief Justice Roberts said um, um, we should celebrate the recognition of this right, um, but don't celebrate the Constitution. Um, I'll paraphrase him in terms of, in terms of these discussions. Um, the idea of letting the people decide, I think, has, it may have something going for it, but it's quite unclear. And as far as uh, we can tell, I'd say that um, the Constitution has nothing to do with um, what's currently happening uh, or not happening in the Senate. Um, those who ask or argue for letting the people decide should be careful what they ask for. Um, they may find that the referendum in the fall is not about the president's nominee or the court's balance, but in fact on the Senate's uh, refusal to advise or consent. questions for Dr. Johnstone. One, if, if we can uh, agree that uh, under the Constitution the people don't really get to decide who the Supreme Court justices are, that's delegated to our representative system, then why can't we say that the voice of the people in this case has already been heard because of the person they elected back in 2012 to be president? a term that hasn't ended yet. Yeah, so uh, another question? Did you yeah, have right. The other one is, if, if you can't get there from here that way, what's to stop uh, President Obama from appointing a justice by executive order and then getting sued by the Senate and let the Supreme Court choose its next member? <laughs> <laughs> Have a minute exam question. <laughs> um, thanks for that. So, just to repeat the question for the so, um, uh, didn't the people already decide by electing the president, um, which, as far as we can tell, he's still in office and holds all the power of the president? Um, um, and then, could they, could, could the president nominate someone or get, sit, sit someone on the Supreme Court without uh, the Senate? Um, on the first point, uh, yeah, I think that's the point. I mean, 104 to 104, that record of um, the Senate has never refused to consider a nominee by a president during his term, unless the president wasn't elected or his successor already was. I think that suggests that that is exactly the, the precedent that we're working under. The people have decided, and for um, uh, uh, since you know, uh, 1790 to today, um, that's been the rule. So this is unprecedented in what they're doing. Um, the, vacant, the recess appointment is a little harder now because of a case the Supreme Court decided in 2014. The Senate will be very careful not to recess long enough to allow uh, what's called a recess appointment, which the Constitution allows. Um, and um, it's not unheard of. So um, Justice Brennan, um, a, a liberal line of the court, was originally in Eisenhower, yes, that Eisenhower, recess appointment. Um, and then was eventually confirmed after the election. Eisenhower, it was a recess appointment because Eisenhower was one of these election year, or Brennan was one of these election year appointees. Um, but the president won't be able to do that because the Senate will ensure that it won't recess the Constitution. Yeah. Here. <laughs> this is a, a question about political speech. Um, or speech from politicians. Um, I don't think I'm being super cynical in that uh, what uh, Senator McConnell said wasn't really being said for us to believe him, but rather it was more an actor delivering a line and we should accept it as 
political theater. Um, and so perhaps not even give it, dignify it with the analysis that Professor Johnston did. Um, in that, I have a feeling it just wasn't meant to be accepted. So, kind of a general question, but what, what, what's the mood on political speech? What are citizens to think of the words coming from Washington? So just with reference to that specific question. So I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, McConnell and other Republican senators used that line that you were talking about. I, mean, I don't think they're concerned with democratic legitimacy. I mean, I think it's a, it's a piece of political rhetoric. Um, and if you look at the type of rhetoric that's being used by the base of the Republican Party, you'll notice that it tracks that language. Um, there's language about the people. Um, so, I mean, there's a bit of signaling, I think, that's going on in this type of speech, too. Um, and uh, it, it's not clear what it specifically means, but it, it mobilizes people, and I think that's really what's going on here. They're interested in mobilizing their base, and they think this is a winning issue. It may be, they may be completely wrong, um, and it, there is a lot of political risk. Um, if the Democrats sweep um, the Senate race, they sweep the White House, um, and this is a sort of public debate that we've been having about the meaning of the Constitution and the public at large, um, uh, we see large uh, Democratic uh, turnout on the issue. Uh, then, arguably, Bruce Ackerman, as you know, at Yale, talks about what is it? You know, how do you actually? Where's constitutional meaning come from? He says it's not just Article Five; it's through these transformative elections that we have. And I think, from us, that sort of point of view, you could say, look, you know, the people have spoken in some sense, um, and uh, we have a different understanding of what the Constitution means. Um, but I think on the level of McConnell, um, I think this is political rhetoric, obviously. But I think it's pitched to a specific audience. Um, and I think it's, maybe it's effective, maybe it's not, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Jason. Could either or, or both of you talk a little bit about what exactly the Republicans are afraid of? What are some of the issues or cases that they see as ripe for being overturned by the radical leftist Garland that has been nominated? <laughs> Um, I, I won't make any psychological claims here, but um, so in terms of the 5-4 cases, right, Heller is 5-4, um, um, Citizens United was 5-4, uh, most of the uh, abortion cases are likely, the recent abortion cases that have been divided are 5-4, um, most of the, well, right, I mean most of common law is 5-4, so, um, you know, of course, there's an interesting point here. To the extent that Garland is is uh, quite moderate, um, um, the question is not so much what he thinks is original is an original matter, but what he thinks about stare decisis, and um, to what extent he feels bound to follow those. And um, you know, it's it's not clear that he's someone who's ready to throw all of these precedents in the uh, trash. Um, the court, by the way, just unanimously this week uh, affirmed that the Second Amendment applies uh, to stun guns. Um, that was nine eight zero. Um, so um, I think there's enough institutional weight to ensure that there'll be some inertia to prevent the, the overturning of all these laws. But of course, no one's ever raised much money by saying that everything's going to be totally fine because of this thing called the Constitution. Sorry, slices. <laughs> Let me just add a point about the politics too. I mean, increasingly in this country, we conduct our politics through the federal courts. Um, Congress does not work well, as you know. Um, Article One, the institution placed at the very center of our constitutional structure, doesn't seem to be working. Um, the groups, the interest groups in our society that have public policy proposals that they care deeply about, um, the companies, the groups, um, they increasingly push their proposals through the federal courts. And so who controls the federal courts um, is terribly important for these organizations. The Chamber of Commerce, I know this hasn't come out, on, this, on the issue, but the, um, the uh, Federation of Independent Businesses has come out against Garland. Um, as I mentioned, the NRA is out against Garland. But you can find this all across the political spectrum. But that's because we do our business we increasingly in the federal courts. And whether this is a good thing for a democracy is a different question. Um, just one, one thing on that. Um, one of Justice Scalia's final acts in office was to be the fifth vote granting the um, completely unprecedented stay against the Clean Power Plan. 
Um, and uh, the conventional wisdom is that on these questions of administrative law, that uh, Judge, wherever everyone else is, Judge Garland is uh, likely to be far more deferential to the sort of rulemaking and, uh, that is done under the Clean Air Act to try to uh, uh, do something about climate change in the absence of congressional action. He's likely to be a vote for the administration. And if you think about uh, immigration and some of the other areas there, um, um, quickly we see how, how that, that might be another issue that would clearly change from the Scalia to Garland. Yeah. Um, judges don't really quite have the cachet of rock stars, and so a lot of people don't know unless they've been in front of them or know somebody who's in front of them. Do you think that there will be a time, or has there ever been a time, when a candidate ran saying, I'm going to appoint so-and-so, or I, I, you, you vote for me because I will put this person forward? And do you see it maybe happening? Right. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I mean the, Gallup poll, the Gallup poll data on this is pretty, you know, kind of, you know, consistent, which is that, in general, you know, who a Supreme Court nominee is ranked very low for the average voter in terms of concern, right? So if you're a politician and you're running on an issue, um, uh, you know, I guess, it, I guess it would depend on what your polling, your polling data is, is showing. Um, uh, I don't know what you, what you think, Anthony, about the... Well, I pass it to you because I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so and, and you'd want to distinguish between the justice and the issues. Right. Um, so it's clear that there is, for example, mobilization um, uh, after, um, um, and actually before I was when Roe v. Wade, um, there was mobilization about Citizens United. Um, so on particular issues, there, there are ways. No one is going to vote. I mean, I, I think that judges are rock stars, but. It's not sure. um, but um, but I think that that if if they're able to politically transform it into an issue, then that actually is something that, that matters. And, and I think the story of the reaction and the rise of the moral majority after Roe v. Wade is one example. I guess I would just um, add that um, if there were, I mean, if there were hearings, I mean, uh, politicians, senators use hearings to try to mobilize constituencies out of public. If there were hearings um, and they were able to publicize uh, uh, the issue sufficiently, you could see that. I mean, um, with current Thomas, for example, there's some data that shows that senators were turned out at the next election, in part depending on where they stood on this issue. By not, you know, not huge margins, but there's, there's some data that seems to indicate that had some sort of effect. Um, but again, these interest groups that are particularly concerned with these constitutional, political, public policy issues are going to be laser beam focused on this sort of stuff, right? Um, but the general voter, I, you know, I guess that's a little more difficult. Um, the guy in the plaid shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm going to pose a hypothetical that I haven't heard anyone address yet. Let's assume that the Senate doesn't confirm. Period. Like not this year, not next year. Period. Are there any remedies to the courts that could force them to do their constitutional duty? And if so, what court would it go to, and who would bring the challenge? Um, no and nobody. <laughs> <laughs> no and nowhere, nobody. Um, I, I think it's relatively clear. Again, crazy things have happened, but um, the, um, the, the Senate's lack of action on something is not justiciable. It's not clear who would have standing on it. The, the more likely pressure point is simply, and it will be interesting to see what the court is doing. Right now, the court is in a holding pattern where they're um, reaching these 4 4 decisions. Interestingly, Justice Alito and Thomas, the two justices who are most aligned with Justice Scalia, have started a practice in the last two weeks of actually issuing decisions that they think what the right answer should be, um, while everyone else kind of ties and lets things go on. It'll be interesting over time to see whether, for example, Chief Justice Roberts, who's a real institutionalist who cares a lot about the the, the court as an institution as its chief justice um, to see whether there are moves there to start showing you know we have to get rid of these four fours so is Chief Justice Roberts going to jump over to the liberal block to try to get these that's the I think that's more likely to be the extent what the court does affects this that's it's likely to do it that way as opposed to coming at it head on um, the guy in the green shirt. <laughs> 
<laughs> so actually related to what you were just saying, Anthony, are there any cases that are on the docket that um, Chief Justice Roberts, presuming that he would prefer to um, captain a ship that was fully staffed and that he is not opposed to Garland, um, are there any cases that he could set up for a 4-4 decision that would be so unpalatable to the Republicans that Mitch McConnell would schedule a hearing? I don't. And see, the, the problem is, is that the institutional integrity cuts both ways. He also can't get political even if he wanted to. And he, he does, he's clearly on the record as respecting um, Judge Garland. Um, I, I think the other thing that's happening, what's happening is the, the so the court has a discretionary jurisdiction. It, it has to, it requires four votes to grant cert. And what's happening is, is the court's no longer granting cert on a lot of cases. And the cases, even the cases that it had that it could have heard this term, it started to push them back. So what it's going to start doing is just not deciding cases. Um, and, and immediately, one of the, I mean, the week after Justice Scalia died, Dow Chemical settled for about $800 million, a uh, major um, class action suit um, um, it, that it had before the court because it, it was literally banking on Justice Scalia. I think, I think what the two things are going to happen um, right, as being the fifth vote, because the law was relatively clear, it thought it had a winner, and when Justice Scalia left, it knew it, it didn't have a winner. So what's going to happen is, there's going to be uncertainty, there's, there's going to be, not to sound too rumspelding on this, but there's going to be uncertainty, <laughs> generally, where you just don't know which way the court's going to come out, whether there are going to be five votes, and then there's going to be certainty with respect to issues where you just, like abortion, and maybe access to courts and things like that, where you just know it's going to tie, and, and you're better off just not wasting your money and, and standing pat with your court of appeals, because the court will be divided. So I think that's how it'll play out. They'll eventually recede into the background again until, unless Chief Justice Roberts feels it's important to assert. Okay, we're going to have the panelists take one more question before we say some closing remarks. Yes, Mike. Um, I don't know who best can answer this, so either or both, but it's pretty clear from what Senator Tester said that if the Republicans choose to stall, they can, and that's what's going to happen, and I think what, you know, a lot of people across America want is at least the hearing to happen, and so is there anything that we can do moving forward as citizens to our representatives, um, obviously to our senators more, um, to force procedure to occur if this were to happen again to where they would be required at least somehow procedurally to hold a hearing. Is there some procedural way within their structure that we can, you know, have them do that? Um, that we can ask for? So, uh, voting would be one, one thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's the in the meantime, I, I, I'll, let, I'll let Professor Peel, uh, but one of the very interesting things about this would be um, that the Senate is, it, again, it's not acting. And so uh, to the extent that they're not doing anything. So what's very interesting is that they are unwilling, by being unwilling to hold a hearing, they do not want to take a vote. They do not want to actually be on record as opposing Judge Garland, because presumably that has, their calculation is that has bad circuit, um, consequences. But, um, I'll just point, that's a very kind of interesting thing about what's going on. It's, it's not that they are affirmatively saying we will not confirm because we know what that looks like. That looks like a vote on the floor of the Senate. They're just not doing anything. And I, I, want, I think a big mystery is, maybe not so much of a mystery, is why they've chosen not to do anything and just actually act and say that, no, we think it's inappropriate to confirm this <laughs> Okay, we would like to thank all the law students and law faculty and the members of the Missoula community who decided to spend their evening with us discussing this very important topic. And we would like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time out of their schedules to speak at the event. Um, and in addition, we would like to thank the UM Retirees Association for helping us co-host the panel. Um, and just a quick public service announcement, the American uh, Constitutional Society. <laughs> Super embarrassing. Uh, and we are holding uh, elections for the student chapter on Monday at lunch room 201. 201. Uh, if you'd like to join us and try to get a board position because all the three L's are leaving, uh, we would love you to come join us and do that. Thank you.